So you're all very welcome. Welcome and well done for having survived through to the third day of this rather intense um, conference that we have. The, as you know, we have featured one discipline each day. Uh, first day, natural science, then social science. Today, ethics and theology. But we have a panel structure so only the first speakers are from the discipline of the day, and the other panelists are always from another discipline. So you're used at this stage to that uh, discipline, to that um, structure. So today, in a, this qualified sense, is the philosophy and theology day. And without any further ado, I'd like to invite Father Philip Renches to come and give an opening address. Father Philip is the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Theology, which is very large in this university, so it's a, it's a large part of, of, of what we do here. The, um, he is a world-renowned expert on St. Maximus the Confessor, and you will be forgiven if many of you don't know who Maximus the Confessor was, but uh, one of the very, very early church, uh, Catholic Church theologians. Uh, the, uh, he has studied in Paris as well as here in Rome uh, along the way. So um, thank you very much. Uh, oh, just to introduce myself, of course. Uh, I am one of five assistants to uh, Father Renches. I'm the director of, of the Department of Fundamental Theology in the, in the Gregorian, in the theology faculty. And I'm from Ireland, as you might have guessed. So thank you very much, uh, Father Renches. <laughs> Thank you very much, Father Whelan, for your introductory words. Dear fellow academics and students, it is an honor for me to welcome you all to the third day of your international conference, Transitioning to Integral Ecology, Transdisciplinary Approaches for the Grounding and Implementation of a Holistic Worldview. During the last two days, I have been able to attend a small number of presentations and to meet with some of you. I want to tell you how impressed I am by the quality of reflection and debate so far, as well as the fascinating geographic and disciplinary diversity among you, the participants. I want to thank you once again, as others have also done, the organizers of this event and you, the participants, who are clearly succeeding in having this conference showcase an interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary method of exploring the complexities of just what it is to pursue ecology in an integral way. I'm impressed by the fact that today you give priority to the dimension of integral ecology that touches on philosophy and theology. As a theologian myself, I'm obviously interested in that dimension. I might add on a personal note, however, that at a younger age, I asked my superiors to specialize in philosophy for my future, but ended up complying to their request to delve into theology. I chose personally to specialize in petrology or the teaching of the so-called church fathers, exactly because in these thinkers I found a deep engagement with questions of philosophy. And I continue to be convinced that it is of the highest importance that the theology we do today be grounded in clear philosophical thinking. This having been said, I would like to offer a reflection on the relationship of integral ecology to theology. Briefly, I suggest that both these areas of academic inquiry need to deepen their links. To ultimate, ultimately reach their goals, they need each other, so to speak, and need to move more soundly toward one another. Regarding ecology reaching out to theology, I know that you have already had contributors commenting on this point. There is, of course, a subtlety to be observed here. Not one, nor 
any religion should seek to impose its theological beliefs on those members of the ecological movement who may wish to commit themselves to a vision of integral ecology that is not explicitly religious. Pope Francis makes this clear at the beginning of Laudato Si and in what follows offers a primarily philosophical vision of what integral ecology involves. At the same time, the Pope stresses that a great proportion of the world's population are religious believers, and so being open to theological perspectives within integral ecology makes sense. To this insight, one can add another. Theology can be of some service even to those who operate in the non-theological sciences as it enters into dialogue with issues of integral ecology. I agree with what has already emerged in this conference on the issue. For example, theology can help the other sciences identify and reject ideology at work in other sciences. Also, theology can help a spirit of ho to develop a spirit of hopefulness in practitioners of any academic discipline, something that can sometimes be lost when one recognizes how profound our ecological crisis is. I would now like to say a word about how theology needs to reach out to questions of integral ecology. Here we enter a question of what Pope Francis has been asking of theology in general, that is to take into account in its reflection and research the importance of reality and lived experience of Christ's followers, the people of God, as sources not only for the very content of theology, but also for its style and its method. This reality for theology presents itself on two focal points that undoubtedly intersect with one another, but at the same time mark two distinct and significant orientations. One is aimed rather at extra and is the recognition of the signs of the time. Presumably, the most urgent and at the same time most eloquent sign of our time is the cry of our Mother Earth, to which people and especially the younger generations lend their ear and also their voice. The Church recognizes itself as an inhabitant of this common house, but must understand this house better. The Church needs to learn how to respect and how to honor it. The second focus directs the gaze at intra. As the Church listens to the call of her Master and Lord, who has given the Church the gift of discipleship under the banner of friendship and co-responsibility for the building of the Kingdom of God. While at first glance this realm of the supernatural seems detached from nature and ecology, there is a growing awareness in Catholic theology that just as the Church is built on the community of natural people, just as the sacraments are based on the elements and products of the earth, water, bread and wine, altogether God's grace that we are seeking is not to be had without the cosmos in which God communicates this grace to us. In other words, even though the kingdom of God we hope for may come at the end of time in its definitive fashion, it will not come against or in disproportion to a cosmological development, but on the contrary, with it comes this kingdom of God and in correlation to it. Obviously, these are huge themes that need so much further analysis, which theology has only started, and altogether only started fairly bashfully, we might observe. In this sense, I feel that this Congress is a wonderful gift of inspiring encouragement, and hopefully a deepening or beginning of friendship among researchers, teachers, and students, and a co-responsibility of different disciplines for this one world, disciplines that have gone separate ways for such a long time. Indeed, what you're doing here has much to teach our theology faculty, and we have so much to learn from you. Thank you very much, and blessings to you all. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Father Renches. Now, as you will uh, remember, we have a keynote speech at the beginning of each day before we move into the panels. So I'd now like to invite Dr. Michael Shook to, be co to come and give our keynote talk for the day. Father, uh, our Dr. Michael Shook is a professor of Roman Catholic social thought in the Department of Theology and a professor of environmental justice in the School of Environmental Sustainability at Loyola University, Chicago. He holds a doctoral degree in ethics and society from the University of Chicago, where he has also received master's degrees in religious studies and political science. He is the founding director of the Joan and Bill Hank Center for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage at Loyola University and currently assists the Vatican de Castri for the promoting of human development within global university engagement in the Laudato Si Action Platform, about which we heard yesterday from Father uh, Josh, uh, who is the overall director of that program. The, his publications include that they may be one, Social Teaching of the Papal Encyclicals, 1740 to eight, 1989, Democracy, Culture and Catholicism, and Healing Earth. So to Dr. Shuk, welcome. Thank you, Gerard, and uh, Philip, and everyone that uh, organized this conference. Thank you very much. This uh, beautiful artwork, which is displayed at the uh, Red Cloud High School Art Museum on the uh, Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, where the Jesuits have the Holy Rosary mission, uh, pretty much encapsulates my entire message for the next few minutes. But I will, go th I will nevertheless speak a little bit more um, and simply have us enjoy this artwork. My main message in the next few minutes is, uh, and you can hear me okay? Okay. Is that the earth, ourselves, all living creatures, and God are transdisciplinary. Yes, uh, transdisciplinarity is an intellectual and methodological challenge that we are working on, and um, it's a very difficult one. But really the challenge, I think, begins with paying attention. And I'm, going, I'm not going to uh, say much on this because I'm in the company of Gerald and Gerard and Patrick, who are Lonerganian experts, but I think Bernard Lonergan has been the missing element in so much of our discussion up to this point. You know, but Bernard was here as a student from 1933 to 1936 and then taught in these halls from 1953 to around 1963, I, I think. But of course, his magnum opus of insight and then method uh, introduced, of course, the transcendental method and the imperatives of consciousness that are happening with us as we listen as you listen to me, as I respond to you, this is all happening. Be, be attentive, be intelligent, be reflective, be responsible, and you know that that succession of, of imperatives of experience, understanding, judgment, and decision. And I'm, no, I'm fairly confident if Bernard was with us at the moment, he'd say we're doing an excellent job at understanding and judgment. We're very poor at paying attention. And we're having great difficulty making good, responsible decisions in the environmental area. And the reason is we're probably not paying significant attention to what's happening. Too much of our understanding and judgment is based on poor attention. Here is an excellent place to go for good attention and good understanding and judgment. And I think Bernard Lonergan would thoroughly enjoy this book, which is highly popular text in the United States since 2015 or 13. My students love it. Robin Kemmerer is a 
as a scientist and a Native American woman. This book is a wonderful transdisciplinary text. She's talking about the natural world. She's talking about social science. She's talking about the humanities. Uh, it's, it, I recommend it to everyone if you haven't read it. But this is the message from the book that I'd want to concentrate on for the next few minutes. In the Western tradition, there is a recognized hierarchy of beings with, of course, the human being on top. The pinnacle of evolution, the darling of creation, and the plants at the bottom. But in native ways of knowing, human people are often referred to as the younger brothers of creation. We say that humans have the least experience with how to live, and thus most to learn. We must look to our teachers among the other species for guidance. Their wisdom is apparent in the way that they live. They teach us by example. They've been on the earth far longer than we have been and have had times to figure things out. I actually think this is very much in the spirit of what Pope Francis is inviting us to when he talks about ecological conversion. We can kind of rhetorically use that term, but do we really bring that into our interiority and mine what that really means? If we are to experience the grace of ecological conversion that Pope Francis speaks of in Laudato Si, I think we really have to set aside for a time, we'll never do it entirely because our careers are too invested in it, but we really have to set aside for a time all our concepts and our data and our utter certainties and our egos and pay attention to the earth, to others, to ourselves, and to the spirit. And especially as educators in a time of ecological crisis to the youth. So I'm going to introduce you to some of the students I had this past year in a variety of courses and pay some attention to them. Uh, Eve uh, was very interested, is very interested in, um, in the impact of ecological crisis on the poor. Uh, Harper is, uh, aspires to be an ecological educator. Uh, Shreya uh, is a, an environmental activist. I'll talk more about her in a, in a couple minutes. Um, Dhruvi is uh, from India and she's very concerned about cyclones and very concerned about climate change because it has cost lives in her own family. Uh, Tane is also from India. He's very interested in the problem of deforestation. Grace has a great passion for ecological spirituality and finding out more about that. Paco is from Mexico. He's concerned about climate change and drought and a water supply in Mexico City. Uh, Matt is passionate about soil. Ariel is is an aspires to be an environmental economist. And uh, Leah is most concerned about how do we live sustainable lifestyles personally. This is just a very small portion of students uh, that I encounter and that uh, Dr. Tuckman encounters in her School of Environmental Sustainability and you can imagine the millions of young people around the world that share these concerns and are passionate about them. I just want to talk about three of the students specifically to, to kind of lift up this question of theology and philosophy and ethics in terms of integral ecology and transdisciplinarity. Tane, as I mentioned, is from India and he's very concerned about forests. We had, he was in a course that I did for the Jesuit Majus Exchange Program. Uh, we do a course called Global Environmental Citizenship. And we had the great honor in that course to have a Zoom conversation with some of Pedro's friends, young friends, um, in the um, Pulangian uh, community, the Pulangian youth in the community there that uh, Pedro lives and works in. And especially, uh, um, I was asking Pedro to remind me of the name of a particular student, and I hope I have the right name because I can't r remember, but there was one of the students that talked 
in this live Zoom conversation with my students uh, who were absolutely amazed to be able to talk to their peers in another culture, in another world. Jason Meneling, who aspires to be a forest keeper in his community, and he wants to learn the traditions of ind his indigenous culture of being a good forest keeper. This was wonderful for Tane to hear and to listen to. But above that, uh, beyond that, uh, Jason was fairly, uh, what should I say, open about the role that his, that spirituality of his culture, the spirituality of his people play in his forest keeping. And Tane was listening very care carefully, as all my students were. Here is my peer talking about spirituality. Well, Tane, in, in the Majus Exchange program, he lands in the University of New Orleans, in New Orleans, Louisiana, which, as you probably remember, or I hope, uh, suffered a horrible hurricane in 2005, Hurricane Katrina. The university sent him out on a service learning project to the ninth, lower Ninth Ward, which was the uh, primarily African-American ward that was the poorest and the most devastated um, because all of the trees had been eradicated in the earlier years and it was a low-lying uh, flooded area. So it's all these years later and they're still planting trees to try to firm up that soil and prevent more devastation when the hurricanes will come as they always do. So he joined one of these uh, tree planting groups and went there repeatedly. And it was a group of people from the Freemason Baptist Church in the Lower Ninth Ward. And if you know anything about American Southern Baptist, particularly African American Southern Baptist Christianity, it's very evocative and very physical and very uh, energetic. Uh, this was something rather new for Tane from India but it was the context where he worked. He was Tindu. He was talking to Jason about, or listening to Jason about Indonesian spirituality and working within the context of evangelical Christians planting trees. Theology. If there's anything, if there's anything that's going to come of this category theology. If there's anything that remains of this category theology uh, as our environmental crisis continues, it's going to be a function of the experience of Tanya and millions of other students who learn what spirituality is from experience and from exchange in the context of the natural world, in a social setting where those humanistic values emerge inductively. This will be true not only for Tane and for his peers, but this must be true for the discipline or it dies. It will have no use because the crisis is demanding us to pay attention. This is Madonna Thunderhawk. She's probably the most important elder in the Lakota community in North America. She's a woman leader that, who goes back all the way to the 1980s, the occupation of Wounded Knee, the occupation of Alcatraz, the history of environmental uh, and indigenous activism in the United States. Wonderful woman. You can see the faces of the students who are so excited to listen to this elder who they recognize as authentic. And I must say, as they also recognize Pope Francis as authentic. I'm not sure all of the radar that young people have in their brains to discern authenticity, but somehow it works and they, they know Pope Francis is sincere. And they knew Madonna Thunderhawk was sincere. And when Madonna talked about her spirituality as a Lakota person, they resonated. Right. 
Madonna told them, we're not protecting water out here on the reservation. We are water protecting itself. What? That doesn't match up with our categories of philosophical anthropology. <laughs> but the students are very interested in this. I've been very interested in it since I first heard it. I journey with my students in this attempt to discover what that could possibly mean. This is Matt, he was in class and he got so passionate about that question. He wanted to continue, he took on an internship at the Lakota People's Law Project for almost a year. And Madonna is a member of the staff at the Lakota People's Law Project. And he did a lot of practical things to help the Lakota people in their uh, activism. But what he was really trying to explore was himself. What does it mean? to say that I am water. Is that some abomination? Is that some kind of an insult to the creator? Is that some insult to God that I should say I am water? No, actually his Christian background made him really struggle with that. What does it mean to be a human in the world? If anything is left of philosophy for our young people as this environmental crisis amplifies, it's going to be this kind of process where our young people can find, the, can find accompaniment in the questions of who they are, in the experiences they have with authentic people, in nature, in society, through the uh, humanistic uh, inspiration and that will be true not only that is true not only for Matt and for I think I can't think of a student in my that, that I encounter who would not essentially have that same experience as Matt and I assume for students around the world and the field of philosophy if the field of philosophy is not paying attention and continues to move on with the old concepts of our generation that we were taught and we hold and, 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 and our, our careers are wound up in these concepts and this data and these understandings. They're so important. They've shaped our lives. We have such a gift to share with our students. Yes, yes. But we're not paying attention. without, as Lonergan said, without paying attention, without self-appropriation self of reality, our concepts and understanding will be limp. This is Sharia, she's uh, an environmental activist. This is the climate change protest in Washington in 2019, and she was arrested there. I have students in my class now that I didn't have 10 years ago that have already been in jail. <laughs> I've been in jail once, but that's, that's a minor uh, credibility. You've got to be two or three if you're really credible in the environmental justice circuit. I have students that have been in jail more than once. It's a mark of prestige. In the class that I did with her, uh, which was a theology class, uh, religious ethics and the ecological crisis, we were up, uh, up paying attention to the Line 3 uh, pipeline protest in northern Minnesota last fall. And we were anxious to go. There were six camps there of, of Ojibwe people um, who were supporting the protest and students could come and be at the camps and learn methods of nonviolent non, non direct action and be on site. The university would not permit me to take the students there for a variety of reasons, but I'm working on that. So I can try to get students out to these locations. It's legal, it's all kinds of other things, but, but we zoomed into these camps and, and the students did as much as they could to support from a distance. Meanwhile, one of our students, the one on the far left, 
Paul Campion, a student of Dr. Tuckman's School of Environmental Sustainability, was doing a hunger strike for climate action in Washington, and he got very ill. He had to be taken to the emergency room and had to have blood transfusion, and he, he um, you know, couldn't, con couldn't conclude the hunger strike until an action had been successfully um, changed. They were appealing to Biden to really support climate change, you know, aggressive climate change legislation, and it wasn't happening. And, um, but uh, students are putting their bodies there. I need to tell them what to do. Right? I need to learn and reanimate what I need to do. So ethics, and I'm, I'm a professor of ethics, as many of you are. For Sharia, ethics isn't going to make any, any sense isn't going to have any real meaning outside of concepts and understanding unless it's, it's brought through engagement and it's brought through experience, the experience of being on the ground with people that are shouting thing, profanities. Oh my God, they're shouting profanities against, um, against the bank. They're shouting profanities against the oil company. You kind of cringe with the language, but it's their language <laughs> and it's their action. And... Uh, Unless that moral urge that we all have is filtered through reality of the natural world, the social context, our hearts, like it has worked through Sharia, ethics means nothing. It means a lot to me, I've been trained, and et cetera, et cetera, but, and the ideas are so pristine and beautiful. But that's my time. And in the environment that I was raised in, which was a happy environment from the 1950s through the 60s, it's not gonna work for our young people. The environment won't allow it. Pope Francis doesn't want us to be stuck there, I don't believe. The earth, ourselves, all living creatures, and God are interdisciplinary. It dis transdisciplinary is an intellectual and methodological challenge, but the challenge begins with me and you to first pay attention while accompanying youth who are already in the future that we really don't what we really don't know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shuk. Very punctual, amongst other things. The, uh, very striking, really. The, the humility to learn from others, learn from our students. Um, the, there can be a whole superstructure of ideas that can lose credibility unless they're somehow anchored in the experience of the audience we're communicating with. And then it's a two-way process that they challenge us. So thank you for that. Perhaps a um, not expected theological talk for those that are not theologians here, scientists and um, the uh, social scientists. So this is the nature of our dialogue. Perhaps uh, we can all recognize the uh, anchoring in the movement that uh, is, has to be the basis of all the other kind of ethical thinking and theological thinking that we're engaged with in the pursuit of integral ecology. So now we move on to our panel phase uh, the, of the afternoon. Uh, I won't give the same long introduction uh, to uh, all our speakers, but a few words. If you remember that the first panel of the afternoon reflects a little bit more on interdisciplinarity itself and its challenges. The second panel is a little bit more applied to one issue in, in integral ecology. So this slightly more methodological um, uh, panel we, we begin now. As always, the first speaker is from the theme of the day. So we have a philosopher, uh, uh, Dr. Pat Byrne from Boston College, 
who is here, you might say, at a parallel conference on the other side of the uh, Cortile here, because with 15 uh, academics from uh, Boston College, they are here doing a whole reflection on the Catholic identity of their university. Um, the, but one thing we notice, uh, in theory we want your, let's say, philosopher, and then your natural scientist, and then your social scientist, but a lot of you are yourselves interdisciplinary. So, in fact, um, uh, Dr. Byrne is also a scientist and a philosopher of science, so he's, he's, he's wearing more than one hat in a sense. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Dr. Father Adam Hinks, a astrophysicist, but you'll see uh, he's from his Roman collar that he's also a priest. He's actually a Jesuit. He was studying here until a few years ago. So another interdisciplinary uh, person, but we're sort of giving the hat of the, the natural scientist to him in the panel that follows. Thirdly, we have the social science category. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Francesco uh, Gambino, uh, who is actually a lawyer, um, has worked remarkably, an Italian lawyer, has worked advising the Chinese government integrating ecology agreements arrived at internationally into the Chinese legal system. But also, um, Dr. Gambino is very philosophical and will reflect as much about culture and law as about the details of, of the discipline of law. So welcome all three of you and we proceed now. Good afternoon, everyone, and it's, um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here and to be invited uh, by my longtime friend, Father Gerald, w Jared Whalen, uh, to be part of this conference. And I do apologize that I've not been able to participate prior to today and that I have to exit after panel 3.2 because we, as Father Whalen said, we do have this parallel conference going on that was planned uh, well over a year ago. And um, as some of you perhaps know, today's conference on, in, or this week's conference on integral ecology was moved from January, uh, where I had hoped to be able to participate fully. And I apologize to so many of you whose presentations and discussions I have missed out on. I also want to thank uh, Professor Michael Shook for his uh, for keynote and, um, and to drawing our attention both to the, uh, the heightened concerns of our young people, and uh, especially to Robin Wall Kimmerer uh, for her wonderful and uh, powerful book, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Uh, she has done a remarkable job of integrating biological science. She's a botanist and an expert in uh, mosses uh, with uh, Native American spirituality. She's a member of the Potawatomi Nation. And, uh, and works in um, a, a place that's about 10 miles from where I grew up in Onondaga, New York, uh, where the Onondaga people are. And she has done this remarkable thing, not of opposing science and religion, but integrating them. And I think Christ, uh, Catholicism in particular and Christianity in general has a lot to learn from the way in which she has uh, brought these two together. And, and I, I can uh, attest, as I think uh, Professor Shook would that our um, students are, are thirsting for this kind of uh, enriching of scientific and ecological concern with uh, the rich symbolic spiritualism of native peoples. Uh, this is not alien to Christianity, but it's something that we haven't been very good at incorporating into our Christian practices and prayer and spirituality for a very long time. Um, I've been asked to speak about the th philosophical and theological foundations of integral ecology and in particular to talk about the foundations that offer a possibility for genuine interdisciplinary collaboration in meeting our responsibilities toward the Earth's environment and the challenges posed by global warming and its dire consequences for climate change. I am a philosopher by calling and will concentrate mainly upon philosophical foundations. But I will also say some, first say something, if only briefly, about theological foundations. But let me begin with the question of why it is necessary to think about foundations 
for integral ecology. There are two kinds of foundational issues that have been raised. First, just what kind of a thing is integral ecology? Since its name contains ology, this seems to indicate that integral ecology must be a science. But is it really a science? This is something that Professor Putz, Oliver Putz, who was to be a member of this panel, uh, was addressing in his concerns, uh, but was not able to be part of this conference this week. It is also something that I will address as a philosopher, relying upon the philosophical work of Bernard Lonergan. The second issue has to do with theological foundations. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis has sketched the theological foundations for an integral ecology and has done so on the basis of a Catholic theology of creation. But the theology of creation has had to undergo significant developments, especially in light of the rise of the biological evolutionary science of the 19th century and the relativistic cosmological uh, uh, and uh, theories of the evolution of the universe in the 20th century. Just how to do Catholic and other uh, real, uh, religious understandings of creation relate to the evolutionary sciences of physics and biology. Uh, my colleague here, Father Adam Hinks, has contributed an impressive essay that goes a long way toward answering this set of questions. And along with Father Hinks, I would argue that theologies and science need a mediator, and I believe that Bernard Lonergan has developed a philosophical approach that helps us meet such questions. Lonergan deliberately set out to develop a philosophy that would facilitate the understanding of interconnections among the various disciplines, the natural sciences, astrophysics and cosmology, chemistry and biology, the human sciences, such as law and jurisprudence in particular, and theological investigations. In particular, he developed a non-reductionistic philosophy of evolution that makes it possible to think about the connections between physics and chemistry and biology and the human sciences, as well as theology. This will be a major theme of my presentation today. First, some brief reflections about the theological foundations of integral ecology. Laudato Si is an unusual papal encyclical insofar as it is addressed to all people and not just to Roman Catholics. It is a call to a complex and ongoing dialogue among all people with special emphasis on what is needed from scientists for this collaboration. Most people in the world assume that cooperation between science and religious faith, and especially Catholic faith, is impossible. But Pope Francis draws on a much overlooked and sometimes contentious tradition within Catholicism that affirms what is authentic in the findings of scientific research is indeed compatible with Catholic faith. While emphasizing the essential role of science must play in human responsibility for the environment, Pope Francis also affirms that Catholicism has uh, something of importance to offer of its own as well. Uh, as, Father, as Pope Francis put it, if the simple fact of being human moves people to care for the environment of which they are a part, Christians in their turn realize that their responsibility within creation and their duty towards nature and the creator are an essential part of their faith. This means that there is a wholeness to creation, a wholeness that includes interrelationships among the primordial elements like earth, water, air, and heat, along with relationships formed within plant, animal, and human ecosystems. Yet this set of relationships is ultimately dependent upon their relationship with God. Christian faith in these facts ground the believer's conviction that uh, in the sacredness of the order of nature and their consequent responsibilities to care for our common home. Pope Francis also situated his encyclical within the tradition of Catholic social teaching. This shows up especially in his analysis of the consequences of human failures to respect the natural and human environment as a created gift. Prominent in his catalog of these failures is the disproportionate impact upon the poor. Care for our common home means care for those most vulnerable to the impacts of environmental change and because this has been central to Catholic ethical teaching for over a century. This theology of creation therefore provides a foundation for an integral theology that connects the motivations and findings of scientific research 
with the values and ethics of care for all creation, human and non-human, the well-to-do as well as the marginalized human beings. Much more, of course, needs to be said about the theological foundations for an integral ecology, but in the limited time, now let me turn to the question of philosophical foundations. Strictly speaking, ecology is the name of a relatively new science. It emerged as botanists moved out of their laboratory studies into field studies. There they had to study diverse factors that set conditions for plant growth and propagation in their natural habitats. Increasingly, they had to draw upon the findings from the sciences of physics of light and heat, as well as meteorology, chemistry, and zoology. The specialized methods of each of these fields in themselves were not sufficient to provide guidance for their assembly. Challenges to methodology of one field were posed by practitioners of others. Only gradually did there emerge a consensus about methods that accepted the interdisciplinary field of ecology as a legitimate science. As we look ahead, a wider integral heuristic is also needed to integrate studies that have to do with human economies, politics, legal systems, social and cultural, and religious practices. Pope Francis's call for an integral ecology would seem to be a call for a new science, but it might be more accurate to call it a call for a new vision of an integral ecosystem a vision of how the various ecosystems, including human, interact in intelligible ways. It is a call for an ongoing assembly of scientific and other forms of knowledge into a whole that understands ever better the complexities of nature, appreciates more keenly its goodness, laments more deeply its degradations, and forms ever better policies for human responses. Yet the dialogue and co collaboration called for by Pope Francis in Laudato Si itself does not provide direction for significant challenges of bringing together specialized knowledge of so many different divisions. As the late Jesuit philosopher and theologian Bernard Lonergan, who taught for many years here, actually in this room uh, at the Gregorian U University put it, Now, every conclusion of science is known by several scientists, but the vast cumulative cooperation of the scientific tradition would be impossible if every conclusion of science had to be known by every scientist. For each science is an extensive array of elements of information and correlation, and the scientific attitude is not to spend one's life checking out what was settled by one's predecessors, but to proceed from this basis to further discoveries. So now I turn to propose a philosophical foundation, and in doing so, I will be drawing on his work uh, regarding what he called emergent probability and what I will call emergent goodness. Lonergan developed his idea of emergent probability from his analysis of the different kinds of questions and insights that scientists have. As he put it, philosophy of emergent probability is an integral heuristic structure which seeks to integrate all questions and insights that form the cores of the various specialized sciences. The key idea in emergent probability is that of a conditioned series of systems or schemes of recurrence. A system is a regularly recurring series of events. The earlier events in the system set the conditions for the, the occurrence of the later events, and the later events circle around to set the conditions for the reoccurrence of the earlier ones over and over again. The discovery of the laws of science explain why the series of events occur regularly. This is because the laws of science are highly conditional. They explain that when some set of conditions occur, others will reoccur. This is what the mathematical laws of physics do, for example. In order to obtain any exact results from those mathematical equations, we have to put in specific numerical parameters. The mathematical equations, the laws of physics, or the climate models do not tell us by themselves what values those parameters must be. How the laws of physics and atmosphere actually function is not up to the laws themselves. 
that functioning is conditioned by the conditions that are actually given, such as temperature, pressure, energy, concentration, momentum, electric charge, and so on. And under some very special sets of conditions, chains of events start to happen that coil around so that later events become the conditions for the reoccurrence of what were earlier events. So under certain specialized sets of conditions, systems emerge. Lonergan recognized that the most primitive types of systems can themselves set the conditions for the emergence of later systems. For example, solar fusion cycles set conditions for the emergence of subsequent, more complex systems on the planet Earth. Because the occurrence of unique sets of circumstances is somewhat random, Lonergan argued that statistical methods are indispensable for a proper understanding of the emergence of ever more advanced and complex systems, such as ecosystems. As he put it, classical scientific laws tell us what would happen if conditions were fulfilled. Statistical laws tell us how often the conditions are fulfilled. He therefore coined the phrase emergent probability to describe the emerging wholeness of the natural universe. Lonergan argued that emergent probability is a framework for integrating the researches of many different sciences. Some sciences discover why certain events occur under certain conditions. Other scientists study the occurrences of those conditions, relying especially on statistical investigations. This framework of emergent probability enables sciences, scientists to step out of their specialized methods and see their work as connected to the work of other specialties which together contribute to an overall vision of a dynamic emerging wholeness of sequences that constitute our universe. Thus Lonergan argued that emergent probability is a framework for understanding the wholeness of the natural world, including human activities. While it's not possible here to explain all the details of Lonergan's argument for this claim, it's important to at least emphasize that for him, emergent probability is a heuristic notion to integrate ongoing discoveries. It is not a finished conceptual system. A heuristic notion is an anticipation of what is yet to be discovered. As heuristic, it anticipates the ways that the findings of the sciences will be made. Therefore, the integral heuristic structure can anticipate the ways that these findings can be connected together with one another. As Lonergan put it, the integral heuristic structure of the emergent probability is about the whole in knowledge, but not the whole of knowledge. That is, emergent probability does not tell us all the details that have been and are yet to be discovered by the sciences, but it does tell us how those discoveries can be related to one another. On a more limited scale, this is what the science of ecology itself had to do at its beginnings, but without the ex assistance of an integral heuristic structure like the one that Lonergan offers. I said earlier that Lonergan's heuristic of emergent probability offers a way of philosophical foundation for integral ecology, but that's not quite correct. He developed his account of emergent prob probability uh, based on another foundation, the foundation that arises out of a form of discernment or self-reflection that he called self-appropriation. Now, it's, it is necessary now to say something briefly about this deeper foundation in order to understand how an integration of scientific knowledge about facts of our natural human ecosystems imply an emergent wholeness of goodness, which has the capacity to guide right actions. According to Lonergan, human knowing consists of a spontaneous self-correcting process of learning. Central to this process is not only insights, but even more importantly, the occurrence of questions which prompt the first set of insights and then stimulate the search for further insights. For this reason, as Lonergan observed, common to all humans is the very spirit of inquiry that constitutes the scientific method. But human inquiry and questioning is not limited to questions about facts, whether by people of common sense or by scientists. Human beings go on to ask further if the facts are good, what kinds of values they possess, what could be done to improve what is already so, and for the sake of what values should actions be taken and ultimately existential questions posed to oneself 
of whether one will actually do what needs to be done. So just as the self-correcting process leads to scientific knowledge of facts, that knowledge in initiates another kind of self-correcting process that leads to knowledge of ethical values and policies of how to make better or to repair what is already the case. Just four brief points about the emergent probability leading to emergent good. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Byrne. Um, in your presentation, uh, you made a compelling case that the interdisciplinarity required for an integral ecology is reflective of what Bernard Lonergan calls emergent probability. That is, the spontaneous emergence of complex systems from simpler systems. You then went on to add a crucial ethical dimension by introducing the notion of emergent goodness. And in so doing, I, I find that you affirm the traditional confluence of the intelligible, the true, and the good that must underlie ecology if it is really to be integral. But I'd like to underscore a point you made about emergent probability per se that I think is extremely pertinent to the natural sciences. So you quoted Lonergan's claim that emergent probability is a, quote, integral heuristic structure. The term heuristic means that it isn't a system of information. It isn't a ready-made bank of answers. Rather, the idea of emergent probability stems from the simple fact that when questions are, ans when questions are answered, new unexpected questions arise. It's a process familiar to scientists. You start by posing what you think is a simple question. But when you start gathering the data, you find that they're multifaceted, and the question itself needs to be reworked. And then when you've figured out some basic answers, you see that you've only uncovered part of a larger, more complex whole that requires a new set of questions. Lonergan's contention is that this spontaneous, unpredictable, and yet always intelligent accumulation of questions that lead to more questions is reflective of the complex and yet always intelligible reality of the physical universe. The point is that the series of questions scientists pose aren't ready-made because the principles governing the physical world aren't predictable a priori. This is the all-important insight of modern science. As Lonergan has pointed out, Galileo didn't figure out how bodies accelerate under the influence of gravity by just sitting in his room and thinking about it. Rather, he rolled marbles down a plane and asked questions about how fast they actually moved. Darwin didn't conclude that natural selection forces new species to evolve by remaining in the libraries of Cambridge. Rather, he sailed to the Galapagos Islands and started asking questions about the curious birds he saw there. And today, climate scientists don't base their forecasts about how much global temperatures will rise on pure speculation. Rather, they set themselves the task of asking about all the possible relations between human activity and the concrete processes of atmosphere and oceans and land masses, and they build models that they refine by asking more and more refined questions. In short, between the questions that scientists ask and the answers that they seek are data. The data are not themselves the answers, but the answers are about the data. The data call forth questions and are the conditions for the answers. And so the data are a kind of hinge. On the one hand, the answers the data yield are intelligible. There are answers. On the other hand, the answers are contingent on the data. You can't predict them. The data could well have been otherwise. 
It's conceivable that there could be an Aristotelian world where marbles rolled down planes at constant velocity or where species appeared by some mechanism other than natural selection or where carbon dioxide were transparent to infrared light and didn't act as a greenhouse gas. But the data of the world we actually live in don't yield these specific answers. Because many answers are possible, we must ask questions of the data to figure out which ones are actually correct. Professor Byrne highlighted this contingency by focusing on how scientific principles play out in space and time. So at one point he said that the laws of science, um, quote, explain that when, some, that when some set of conditions occur, then some other events will occur. So for instance, if CO2 emissions rise to 80 gigatons per year by the end of the century, the average global temperature will increase two to four degrees relative to today. If on the other hand, we become carbon neutral by 2050 and then start removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, the temperature rise should be less than a degree. The same laws of atmospheric physics and of oceanography and radiation and fluid mechanics and radiation, all these laws are operative in both scenarios, but what we'll obtain is contingent on the actual conditions on the ground. There's a further aspect to this contingency. Not only is the instantiation of the laws contingent on concrete conditions, but the laws themselves are contingent. So for instance, the equations pertinent to radiative and thermodynamic processes are representative of relations that obtain in real life physical systems. The scientific method doesn't presume to know a priori what those equations are. It doesn't presume to know how thermodynamics or radiation work a priori. You need to query actual data to figure them out. To get the equations, you need to figure out which equations fit the real life data. So there are two kinds of contingency the contingency of things that happen and the contingency of the relations between those things that happen. Lonergan refers to them as central potency and conjugate potency. So roughly speaking, central potency refers to aspects of data that are singular and conjugate potency to aspects that are relational. Questions about the central aspects yield answers about things. Questions about the conjugate aspects yield answers about how things relate. That is, they yield physical laws. The two are completely enmeshed together. Different things are understood by relating them one to another, and relations are understood only by comparing different things. Or as Lonergan puts it, the relations are settled by the terms, and the terms settled by the relations. The scientific method consists in continually posing questions about these terms and relations. And the physical sciences hone in on the relations to figure out what the most fundamental equations are for relating things under the most general conditions. Let me bring this home now to integral ecology and reconnect my thoughts to Professor Byrne's notion of emergent goodness. I've been emphasizing that all science is data-driven and that all data are contingent. This is literally what the word data signifies. Data just means givens, or things that are given, in Italian dati, in French donné. At its heart, the scientific method engages with a world of givens, a reality that is given. Not only are the things and events and the circumstances given, but the ways in which things and events and circumstances relate to each other are given. The theological name for this radical givenness that permeates the world is creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing. Creation from nothing is the theological claim that everything about the world is given because the world is fundamentally a gift. It owes nothing, nihilo, of its being to itself and everything to another. And so in the Abrahamic vision, creation is not just a collection of passive givens, but is the fruit of a divine act. Creation is given by the divine giver as gift. In other words, if a philosophy of science recognizes the givenness of the world, a theology of creation explicates that the givenness is gift. 
So while the natural sciences enjoy a real autonomy, I mean, you can do science without, without theology just fine, but I would argue that they are still intrinsically open to theology insofar as they take the world as given. Integral ecology, at least as far as I understand it, takes this openness seriously and invites an identification of givenness with gift. With this identification, namely, that the data or givens of the natural sciences might actually be a total gift from the divine goodness, a whole ethical vista opens up. Our world is not just intelligible and understandable through the natural sciences. The very same world, the same world that's studied by the sciences, is also a gift which calls forth our sense of responsibility to honor, safeguard, and indeed participate in its goodness. Thus, emergent probability is also recognized as emergent goodness. Let me close by posing uh, two possible lines of further development of this theme of givenness and gift. So first, a problem with the ethical dimension of integral ecology is the human tendency to treat the world not as gift, but as an exclusive possession. And I think that this is not just a problem of ecology, but more basically a problem of original sin. Uh, to sin is to turn away from the giver and treat oneself and one's companions and one's surroundings as though they were one's private possession. And I, I see this dynamic clearly evident in many of our ecological issues today. According to the Christian faith, the solution to sin can't come purely from human goodwill, but is ultimately found in the order of grace. This would imply that integral theology would be incomplete without a theology of grace. Correlative with the healing of the planet would be a healing of the human soul. And then finally, just to wrap up in the last few seconds, um, if God's gift is good, is it not also beautiful? If emergent probability is the grounds for an emergent goodness, then might there not also be emergent beauty? We scientists are motivated by many things, but it seems to me that, the most, that most fundamentally we have a conviction that not only is it good to study the world, but that there's elegance and beauty to be discovered. Perhaps just as much as fostering a sense of responsibility before the goodness of creation, integral ecology can be an invitation to contemplate its beauty. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It is an honor for me to be here in this conference. Uh, the logic of the interdependence or correlation between the conditioner and condition, a phenomenon so present uh, in all the sectors of science, as well clarified by Patrick Byrne, is a central theme in the field of the law. However, it is necessary to specify that in the context of law, civil law, public law, company law, criminal law, etc., the relation between conditioner and conditioned has nothing to do with the laws of nature. Therefore, I will examine this relation not from a scientific but from a legal, sociological and cultural perspective. Here we will observe the law in its search for integral solution to ecological issues in which the law has can be read in the Laudato Si, paragraph 177, acts as an effective moderator of society. I would like to underline that a technical reference to the law, be it national, international, transnational, is found in 11 paragraphs of the Laudato Si. Okay. Hello, allow me to consider the uh, two lines of research from inside and outside the law. From the first point of view, the law for its structure uh, relies on a nexus between uh, the facts and their legal effects. By imitating the laws of nature to explain the uh, regularity 
of phenomena through the principle of causation, the legislator creates a connection between a fact and a given legal event. If A, then B. If A occurs, uh, for example, if a company pollutes, pollutes, sorry, thereby committing a tort, then B must happen. The company has the obligation to compensate the damage. This must happen is evidently not a necessity, but arises uh, from the legislator's decision. It is through this nexus that political and legislative authorities can condition the behaviors of a large number of people. It works as an orthopedic device in order to bend the human actions to rule of ethics, as affirmed by several philosophers of law. We now come uh, to the outside of the law. Sociologists of the law have studied the problem of the enforcement of the law and the effectiveness of the legal system. And the law has the capacity to orient individual behaviors and to be effective if it takes into uh, consideration how society functions. In uh, this respect, it could prove useful to recall the writings of an Italian physicist, uh, Tore Majorana, who in a paper published in 1942 uh, examined the problem of the causal explanation of phenomena, natural phenomena, human behaviors, in physics and in social science. He confirmed the value of statistical laws in both fields. This is the same idea expressed by Giorgio Parisi, the Italian winner of Nobel Prize for Physics in uh, 2021. The interpretation of the tendencies of society, statistical data relative to collective behaviors, is, according to Majorana, a special art, one of the most appreciable supports to the art of governing. Uh, we are here dealing uh, with a physicist who, starting from the value of statistical laws, ends up explaining the basics of the art of go governing. Uh, we might say that legal and political systems need statistical law in order to understand human in reality and thus effectively carry out their action to orient society. Statistical laws could one day tell us that there is no need for national or in transnational international laws by virtue uh, of the um, radical ecological conversion of all humankind. However, until that day, the law remains essential to orient and rectify ecologically damaging behaviors. In my opinion, this explains the space dedicated to the law in Laudato Si and in Fratelli Tutti. In this context, I refer to any law as a, mo as a modern democratic tool, rational modern democratic tool, whose content is in line with the values of the Constitution. Uh, in the more general context of a well-functioning society, let me mention some sectors where an ecological problem exists, as we all know commercial air transport, production of electric power in different sectors, emission from heating and air conditioned systems, ecological burden of consumer goods, the negative results of raw materials to produce consumer goods. Uh, we read in Laudato Si, as I said before, that a society as the capacity to plan and protect its future to the extent that the law acts as a, an effective 
effective moderator laying down the rules for admissible conduct in the light of the common good. The law as a modern age tool can provide an answer to many of the issues raised the ball. I just make a few examples. The obligation for individuals to limit the use of air transport. In French, there is a bill in this sense. Uh, this measure would contribute to the controversial system of carbon credit markets as well. Laws limiting the uh, purchase of cars and encouraging uh, the purchase of uh, uh, zero emission vehicles. Uh, in uh, Sweden, there is a law in this sense. Uh, the obligation for producers to inform consumers on the ecological burden of goods. The obligation for companies to implement ecological programs and strategies. Uh, new international laws, as Christine uh, Weizsäcker said yesterday, on Monday, uh, new international laws on liability for environmental damage. This approach, possibly called the ecological analysis of the law, could pave the way for a new discipline aimed at quantifying the short or long-term ecological benefits of introducing new uh, legal uh, provisions. The response of uh, the law to the technocratic paradigm must be firm and effective. This explains the need for sanctions, uh, safeguarding instruments, control authorities, and law enforcers. The law capable of responding to the technocratic paradigm not only national, but transnational, uh, because as in the case of capital, commercial relations and competition, it extends beyond the territorial limits of single states. And Ernst uh, uh, Weizsäcker said here in this conference, today market is over the law. It refers to the law that originates from agreements between states belonging to different cultures, traditions, and customs. Recalling the philosophy of culture and communications conceived by Bernard Lonergan, uh, we need to understand the actions of others and enter their historical, social, uh, cultural world. The last slide, sorry. In my opinion, the law, through its linguistic structure and concepts, is capable of facilitating a dialogue based on scientific studies, subjects common to many Western and Eastern cultures, laws, the state, the legal system, legal entities, ownership, contractual agreements, criminal offenses, the trial, the sentence, bona fide, the notion of damage, form a common cultural ground. From here, a common understanding and programs on ecological issues can take shape. Thank you.